In the days of Herod the king, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel said, Thou shalt bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be called the Son of the Highest, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord. And the angel departed from her. It came to pass that there went out a decree that all the world should be taxed, everyone in his own city. And Joseph went up from Nazareth to a city called Bethlehem to be taxed with Mary, his wife, being great with child. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them at the inn. There were in the same country shepherds keeping watch over their flock by night. And the angel of the Lord came upon them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, I bring you good tidings of great joy. For unto you is born a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Suddenly there was a multitude of the heavenly host, saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will toward men. The shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem. And they found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, praising God. When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star went before them, till it stood over where the young child was. And they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Being warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. And the angel appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take the child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, for Herod will seek the child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt. Then Herod was exceeding wroth and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem from two years old and under. Then was their lamentation and weeping and great mourning. But when Herod was dead, an angel appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Take the child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead which sought the young child's life. And he took the child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel, and dwelt in Nazareth. And the child grew, and waxed strong in spirit, 
filled with wisdom. And the grace of God was upon him. Amen. Let us pray. Dear God, come and meet us here today in the face of your infant son. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you, Krista, for that wonderful rendition of the Christmas story. That version we read this year had some challenging words. It used what is called the King James Version of the Bible story, which was written in Old English. Sometimes I like reading that Old English. It stretches out your mouth. Thou shalt bring forth a son, and thou shalt name him Jesus. Kind of like yoga for your tongue. Ever since my sons, Graham and Lucas, have been home from school during this pandemic, we've been doing yoga and other exercises at home. Sometimes we do cosmic kids yoga or listen to the CD, sitting still like a frog. They're both really good for your body. But even more important than having a healthy body is having a healthy tongue. Did you know that? When Jesus grew up, he spoke a lot about how important our words are. One of the things he said was, the mouth speaks out of the overflow of the heart. So it's good to watch what we say closely. If we practice saying good things and building people up, it means that we have a good heart. I know you have a good heart. You made the choice to worship with me right here and right now. Even if you're watching this on YouTube after the fact, you chose to invite God into your day and to seek to get to know Jesus better through this time of Christmas worship. Now, there's a lot of things that Jesus wants to teach you, but today is a special day for remembering Jesus when he was a little baby. It's a little hard to learn from a little baby, though, isn't it? They can't talk yet, so we can't listen to the words that they say. They can't see much yet, so that we can't really look them in the eye. And they can't even control their little arms, so if you put your face up to them, you're likely to get a little baby fist right to your nose. Thankfully, it's not going to hurt very much. A baby can't hurt you. That's the thing about babies, is that they are completely vulnerable. And because they are completely vulnerable, they are completely at the mercy of those around them. Later on in life, you probably know how being vulnerable worked out for Jesus. The people he came to love and to lead towards God turned on him and killed him. At Easter time, when we think about Jesus' death and resurrection, it's easy to think about Jesus as a kind of hero figure, facing down the powers of this world and taking the worst they had to offer and then conquering them by rising from the dead. But on Christmas morning, there's no hero. We don't see the godly man that this baby will become. We just see a baby lying in a manger. Wrapped in swaddling clothes, needing his mummy and daddy to feed him, change him, and comfort him when he cries. The only way we learn from a baby is by allowing our hearts to be moved, allowing our hearts to be warmed. Not just by how beautiful the baby is, but by the beauty of a world where all who enter into it are completely vulnerable and completely dependent on others. It's a beautiful kind of thing, but it's a risky kind of thing too, isn't it? To depend on other people. Each of us at one time or another in our lives feels helpless and vulnerable. As each one of us grows as a child, and then as we grow into adulthood and journey through life, and then as we reach the end of our lives and our bodies start to fail us, all of these stages of life put us into vulnerable situations. This pandemic has put us all in a vulnerable situation. It's a time when so much is out of our control, and I'm sure every one of us is feeling vulnerable in some way. It's during these times of feeling vulnerable that some of our earliest memories come flashing back to us. 
memories when we were young children and felt especially vulnerable. Maybe those memories that come back to you are good memories. Memories when those around you were sensitive to your needs and loved and cared for you. Or maybe those memories are not so good memories. Times when you didn't receive the care that you needed and it hurt. No matter whether those memories are good or bad, each of those memories that bring you back to your own time as a young and vulnerable child are a window given to you. They're a window which opens onto this nativity scene. Each of those earliest memories provide us with a glimpse of the risk that God took on by taking on flesh and entering into this vulnerable human life. Those of us who have been hurt in our vulnerability might question the wisdom of such a risk. But the Bible tells us that wisdom comes from the Spirit of God. And this risk was a risk that the Spirit of Wisdom herself was willing to take, knowing full well the end from the beginning. The Spirit of Wisdom visited the Virgin Mary and miraculously placed that embryo in her womb, knowing that the baby would be threatened from that moment on. Wisdom knew that the baby would not have a hospital in which to be born. Wisdom knew that the child would grow up poor. Wisdom knew that as a young man, he would be rejected by those closest to him. And wisdom knew that he would suffer an early death in the prime of his life. The spirit of wisdom knew all of these risks, and yet she chose it. She chose to make the child who is not just her child, but one God with her, subject to the risks of life because there was something redemptive in the risk of taking on human flesh. Not just the death and resurrection, which would come later on. There was something redemptive in the incarnation itself. That taking on of flesh and the baby Jesus is redemptive because when the vulnerable one encounters others, there is a transformation which begins. Much is made these days of the power of vulnerability for the one being vulnerable, but not much is said about the power given to those who encounter the vulnerable one. The vulnerable one shines a light into the souls of us who encounter them. And that light warms our hearts. But that light also reveals something very important. It reveals to us the state of our souls. That light of the vulnerable reveals the state of our souls to us unlike any other experience in this world. This is why the adult Jesus said that when we feed the hungry or give water to the thirsty or invite the stranger in or clothe the naked or care for the sick, or visit the prisoner. We do these things for Christ himself. Christ reveals himself to us in the faces of the vulnerable, and their faces shine a light into our souls. When I was a little kid, I was always afraid of the basement of our old farmhouse. It was cold and dark, and full of crickets you couldn't help stepping on in your sock feet. The only way I was ever comfortable going down there as a kid was if, when I went down there, I immediately turned on the light. And then I'd go into all the rooms one by one and turn on the lights in each of those rooms as well. Once I'd turned on all the lights, I could see the crickets and not step on them. But even more importantly, the lights would drive out every bit of darkness. Darkness is something to be feared because it is unknown. But once you shine a light on whatever is there, you are empowered. That is why looking into the face of the vulnerable is so powerful. It shines a light, and for maybe the first time in a long time, we can see the state of our souls. That experience, of course, is not always comfortable because we don't always like what we see. But at least if we don't like what we see, we are then empowered by knowing what needs to change. 
I would guess that shining a light into your soul would be more like me in my parents' basement. I'm willing to bet that by shining a light into your soul, you won't see that boogeyman that you've been fearing. You'll probably find a big dusty room with space to play and to grow. Sure, there'll be crickets, but when your soul becomes a bright playroom, you just learn to dance around them. This morning, may you look on the face of the baby Jesus and may a light shine into the playroom of your soul and may you dance. Amen.